winning now and I ain't never going back down. Welcome to The Rise. I'm Corey Alexander, and the fortunate pleasure to be here with one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. One of my heroes growing up that tells you how old he is. However, Ralph Sampson, UVA's finest, the Valley District's finest, and one of the country's best, one of only two three-time National Players of the Year. And my guy, Stick, how you doing, my man? Welcome to The Rise. Come on, Valley guy. Come on, you know you you you, you still uh, got gray hair, so you you you're getting older by the day, but it's worked. I'm good. I'm here in Charlottesville, hanging out, but all is well uh, in the Valley. Glad to hear that, my man. And of course, you know we talk about the Valley. We talk about the Shenandoah Valley. You grew up in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Now you had a split life because you had life in the city where you grew up playing on the playgrounds but you also had the farm life. Tell me a little bit about your family dynamic, you and your sisters growing up in Harrisonburg. Well, I think you've been through there a couple of times. So you know the Valley, McGaggersville, Virginia, but uh, farm life was cool because it was just about family, tradition, um, grandparents uh, that you know, passed away before I was you know, even born, uh, my mom's side, but nine uncles that were in World War II and three aunts, uh, two other aunts beside my mother, so 12 siblings total. And so you can imagine family reunions with probably 48 first cousins, and that's just first cousin down the line, and uh, the garden and building of hay. So the hard work uh, was instilled in me at an early age uh, on the farm, but also took my parents as well. But it's nothing like farm life to me, and uh, it's still in the family today. And I'm actually repurposing it and making an agro-tourism location destination so people can understand the history of my family. Well, and I've actually been able to hang out with you at the farm before, so I know and I saw a lot of the work that you did as a kid. But you're also doing a lot of work on the playgrounds, working on your game. And again, when you grow to be 7'4", you're always taller than everyone. But going into the ninth grade, you were 6'9", but you were a shy kid, right? Oh, yeah, yeah very shy. Uh, um, didn't talk to anybody, very shy, very standoffish because of the height. Um, my high school classmates, you know, were really energetic and wondering every year how much did I grow? Because, you know, when you come back to school, everybody said, well, how much did you grow? Well, I was growing faster than most kids. Uh, the very surreal moment was that my locker in high school was right beside the shortest girl's locker in the school. And so we had some some stories and some antics going on there, which was pretty fun. And then when I reached seven foot tall in the 11th grade, I had a shirt made that said, I am seven foot tall, because I got asked that question every day. When will I be seven foot tall? I, I mean, I don't know what my body's going to do at that point, right? So I got a shirt. <clears throat> Ironically, it was an orange shirt with blue letters, right? Which I didn't know at that point in time I was going to go to UVA. But I gave that shirt to my uh, college uh, classmate. Uh, she lived in Austin, Texas. Now I think she still has the shirt. <laughs> well, we got to put that in the farm museum. Make sure we get that back. Yeah, we got so to we we find it somewhere. Yeah, we got to find it. <laughs> and you mentioned your junior year where you were a state champion as a junior and also a state champion as a senior at Harrisonburg High School playing for Coach Roger Berge. And tell me a little bit about that relationship with Coach Berge and how he helped you, you know, get out of the introverted ways and by putting a basketball in your hands. Well, I mean, you know, you mentioned the Valley District before. I mean, you got Roger Berge, you got Paul Hatchett, Stanton, Ari Lee, which they changed the name, obviously. You got you at Waynesboro, you got Lexington, you got Luray. You had a mecca of great talent back in those days, guys that could play the game of basketball, but we also had great coaches. They taught us how to not only play the game, but also how to act in the classroom, how to act in life, how to be respectful. He taught us uh, really life and almost like a, a godfather to us. And so I think every coach in the Valley District area was just like that. When you talk about Coach Berg, you talk about your father. I know those guys were positive role models for you, but who were the basketball players that you looked up to and guys that you watched on TV and said, hey, I want to be able to do what that guy does? Yeah, I mean, my dad obviously is uh, the man of my life, and uh, Coach Brady, Coach Holland, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, basketball, then you, you know, you didn't really watch much NBA because NBA in the 70s, late 70s, were not as um, uh, highly televised as it is today, obviously. But you can see, because being in Virginia, Virginia Squire with Julius Irving, 
uh, you know, actually is one of the ones that everybody wanted to be like, flying through there, dunking the basketball, et cetera. Uh, and then I started to understand the game and then go back to uh, Elgin Baylor, or Bill Russell, or Will Chamberlain, or Fremont Duty Bar. Once you start to feel the game, and you can also find some of those highlights, which was very hard to find back in the day. I became a student of the game very early uh, and wanted to be really good early, but my body was growing so fast that, you know, I grow, I get good, and I had to start all over again. And so the role models back then, not only the coaches, but the game of basketball could teach us a lot about how you want to play because, again, it's not like today, right? It's not like today's game. When we come back, how Ralph's success at Harrisonburg High School created a recruiting frenzy as virtually every college in the nation sought to have the seven foot four phenom come to their school. In North Carolina was in, in the hunt. I would play with me, Worthy, Perkins, we'd have played together. That crew would have been probably pretty good. Uh, Jordan would have been, I guess, okay. You got a Nike shirt on there, but you know, I'm a football guy, so it worked out that way. <laughs> Welcome back to The Rise with Ralph Sampson. What you were able to accomplish in high school, the world was your oyster. You had an opportunity to go anywhere you wanted. No one was more recruited than you were. And you decided to stay home and go to University of Virginia. What was the major factor behind that decision to stay in the state? Well, if you should recall, it's from the, the farm life with Buck's family, uh, the community from Coach Bergen High School, uh, my mom and dad, sisters, I mean, you know, I, I went to Kentucky, and, and when I got there and saw the visit, I said, I'm, I'm going to Kentucky. And, and it was like the best visit I had. Virginia was the worst visit I had, actually. Um, North Carolina was in, in the hunt. I was playing with me, Worthy, Perkins, we'd have played together. That crew would have been probably pretty good. Uh, Jordan would have been, I guess, okay. You got a Nike shirt on there, but you know, I'm a football guy, so it works out that way. <laughs> uh, but we'll figure that one out. But UVA, because the proximity of home, my parents could see me play academically, very good school. Coach Allen, amazing. And I had some pretty good teammates uh, coming in with Jeff Lampley, Breaker, Jeff Jones, you know, next year, Othell, Ricky, Ken Nealon, uh, Craig Robinson. But, you know, I know a lot more about the game as I, as I got older, but. I made the right decision and uh, I don't look back. Yeah, I agree, you made the right decision. I can remember the teachers rolling in, the carts, ACC tournament time, and me getting to watch you on TV. Of course, you know, 1981, you guys going to the Final Four, which was an exciting year for, for me growing up in Waynesboro and watching someone from the Valley District. Take me back to that matchup in 1981 in the Final Four where you had to go head to head with the Tar Heels. Well, I mean, first of all, you were the young kid in, in high school, and they roll a TV as you watch games. So y'all didn't have any classwork to do. Y'all was watching basketball games. <laughs> I, so was, in, get I right. was in elementary school. Okay. I was in elementary, elementary school. Don't high school. school. Yeah. What, 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 one of the two, whatever you think, like fifth grade, whatever, you still weren't get, getting, getting any education at that point in time. But anyway, um, you know, so, so that was in the spectrum in Philadelphia. Uh, the intensity was high. It was, you know, fun to go to Final Four. Uh, you know, 16, 17, 18,000 people, UVA fans was crazy. It was fun. We had, I actually thoroughly enjoyed it. And one of the reasons I stayed in school was come back and try to do that again because it was fun to get at that level. I'm sure that Dean Smith didn't like that I went to Virginia. Uh, he blames, actually, I'm wondering how crazy it is. He blames Al Wood for losing me on the campus at North Carolina when I went to school on my official visit, right? Where'd you go? I went, and Al Wood was the blame, right? So that's probably why Al Wood beat us in a game uh, from that standpoint. But, you know, I talk to Al Wood all the time these days, minister down in North Carolina, a great guy. And so I told him, I said, Al, you know, North Carolina beat us, you did. So, you know, he had a phenomenal game. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, first time I've ever experienced it, obviously, in high school, we went back-to-back -back state titles, but nothing like going to the Final Four with your teammates as you battle. Now, you have to understand, the year before, we went to the NIT and won it. So we were poised, but we didn't even get to the dance the year before. And then the next year, we get to the Final Four. So a big turnaround for us. But, uh, you know, great, great memories. Um, great time for me and then my teammates as well. Well, and you mentioned also, you know, the re one of the reasons why you stayed in school. Now, each year, freshman, sophomore, and your junior year, you had an offer to go to the NBA after those years. Now, I think I can say this at this point. You got a visit at home 
<laughs> from one of the most legendary figures in the game the basketball and basketball history has ever seen. Tell me about yeah. your visit for Red Arbach <laughs> when he came to the house. Red Arbach came to my parents' house and there's a picture somewhere as well that he has a briefcase in his hand as he walks in the door with a million dollars in it. So it was after my freshman year and we beat Minnesota and Kevin McHale, Randy Brewer and that crew to win an NIT. And it, I could have came out that year and went to the Celtics and played with Larry and Robert Perry and that crew. So Kevin McHale wouldn't have went to the Celtics. So obviously that history is, is well cemented, right? So it was a fun, exciting time because, you know, I was a freshman, I was trying to figure it out. I was still only 205 pounds, maybe, right, soaking wet. And to have Red right back come to my parents' house and put a million dollars on the table. Now, we didn't get to touch the money, right? We could see it, so it might have just been all hundreds on the top, I don't know. You really allowed for college basketball to enjoy getting to see Ralph Sampson as much as, you know, any star we've seen in college basketball. You squared off against Patrick Ewing. You squared off against Akeem Olajuwon. You squared off against all the big game, big time names, and you won all those battles in college. And when you look back at that, how special was your college career at UVA for you to be able to say, hey, we took on all the best guys and we beat them all? We played everybody in the country that were in the top 10, whatever, for like a couple weeks period span. And then we are getting up to play Patrick in, in, in Georgetown. It's a great memory not only for me, but hopefully UVA as well. Coming back, that, those games would have never happened if I didn't come back to school. When the rise continues, after an epic career in Charlottesville, Ralph reflects on his final home game at the University of Virginia. You know how that is, you go to the line, like, okay, great. I'm afraid this thing goes in. Welcome back to the rise. We are hanging out with basketball legend, Ralph Sampson. And Virginia fans were fortunate to watch you for four years. Ralph's house was on top of the building, on top of University Hall, but it almost seems as though you saved your best for last. Your senior night game against Maryland, you get to the free throw line. If I'm correct, you miss both free throws? Is, is that what happened? Two free throws. This is not a one and one and he misses the first. So that the best Virginia is going to come out of this with, with seven seconds left, is a tie. You know, it's just a matter of being a, a little too tight and, um, you know, Wanted to win so bad that you missed, missed, missed the free throw, so. Ralph Sampson, the premier player in the world, with a free throw, and he missed it, in and out, tipped outside, Sampson has it, and he scored! Four seconds left. Teammate Craig Robinson would say, I tipped the ball back out. So it was his tip, my catch turned and shoot it, but you know how that is, you go to the line, like, okay, great. I'm afraid this thing goes in, but you know, God was on my side <laughs> at that point in time, so I can't complain. I have to ask you this. When you look at the ACC, what was the best era of basketball in the ACC? Oh my God, I mean, you would say your time, I would say mine. <laughs> we, we, we could debate that. So, I mean, I played against Gene Banks, Jamiski, Spernarco when I first got to UVA. That when they had won championships, played against you know, Carolina with Jordan Perkins, Worthy, Darty, Jimmy Black, the Hoku, Duke. They didn't have that much of a good team, but they started with Johnny Dawkins later on. Clemson was the toughest place to play because they had Larry Nash, Moose Campbell. They had three big guys that played in the NBA, but they couldn't win. Maryland had um, Ernest Graham, Albert King, and, um, and Buck Williams. I mean, Buck Williams was the toughest dude you want to play against. So that, yeah, that was a rock. So every night, I think that started the ACC, even Years ago, before that, Phil Ford, Wally Walker years, ACC was good. But I think I think our era was pretty good. You had the the best career of anyone, you know, ever at University of Virginia, ever in the ACC, as far as I'm concerned, and one of the top three careers in college basketball history. So you're going into the NBA draft, you get drafted by the Houston Rockets, and you guys have the opportunity to draft Akeem Olajuwon with the number one pick the following year. Not only in your second year were you an all-star again, but you were the all-star game MVP. Things are going well for you in your career. You move forward into your third year. Now you and Akeem take the Houston Rockets, who were not in the playoffs two years prior, 
you beat the Showtime Lakers and you're facing off with the Boston Celtics in the NBA Finals. What's going through your mind at this point when you're, you're still very young in your NBA career, but you're already at the pinnacle? Going to the Finals, this, it was crazy. It was fun. It was, uh, you know, you're only two last two teams left. But we had Bill Finch as a coach, and he had coached Larry and Robert them a number of years ago in KC Jones when it took his spot. So it's ironic that all those pieces came into play. But the most most memorable part of that series, if not winning or losing, is that I got in a, I got in a fight in Houston. It was uh, three games to three games to one, and they were they were up. And uh, I didn't, I didn't want them to win on my court. I get into an altercation with Danny Ainge and Jerry Seesting in that game, and we go to fighting, etc. And I look to the left of me on the court. My two sisters, as you know. We're on the court getting ready to fight as well. We ended up winning that game, which was fine. Now we're going to Boston with a chance, but we got to win on the Boston floor. But when you go to the Boston Garden and play in a, in a game that they can win a championship, it ain't nothing like that either. Uh, because the June, the locker room is going to be hot. As you know, it's really small. Uh, not enough room to move around. And Red Arbat's going to turn the heat up on you, which you always heard on TV, but you never experienced it, right? But Bill Fitch knew, okay, once we were at the point we were going to lose the game, he just called timeout, and all of our starters, we just went on to the locker room. Back then, you didn't understand. I want to play to the buzzer. I think we can win. Let's play, play, play. But you understand you had a good coach like that that can teach you those things. And you look back and say, wow, what a fun time to play, you know, coming, like you said, from high school, winning high school championships to college going to the Final Four, three-time college play year, all that kind of stuff is all fun. And then going to the finals and playing with Kim Olajuwon, Ryan McCray, a good friend of mine. Those memories and stories last for, for a lifetime. Up next, Ralph returns to his hometown and gives back to the community when the rise continues. Welcome back to The Rise with Ralph Sampson. It hurt me to watch you lose that final series, but I tell you what hurt me even more is that same summer, I am at a camp, and who happens to be the guest speaker other than my hero, Ralph Sampson? And whatever reason you called me out on the stands, whatever we did, somehow or another, you made me do wall sits. And I don't know why I had to do wall sits. <laughs> That was one of my but that was my first time. <laughs> yes, I know it was. And you had me do wall sits for over a minute. And again, that was something I ended up adapting and using with my kids during my training all the time. And again, that's something that you do now. Tell me a little bit about, you know, Winter Circle and your, your foundation behind that and your plans for that moving forward. Yeah, it, it, it has evolved over the years. So, uh, Winter Circle Enterprises is my, my, my main company. We just launched a Winter Circle Venture Company this August, uh, which is a venture, uh, capital venture company. And we, in the midst of raising $100 million for minority companies in the state of Virginia and around the country as well, it's going really well. But then on the foundation side, we went from Winter Circle Foundation, we changed the name to Samson Family Foundation. And what I just do is take on initiatives in the Valley Rockingham County and, and the Valley. So between Rockingham County and Augusta County in that area where we live is the largest agricultural county in the state of Virginia, Barton. And Rockingham County is the largest due to the, all the poultry and whatever. And kids go in our county hungry, going to school, et cetera. So we will next year plant, hopefully, with a number of farmers, about 80 tons of potatoes that will go directly to the food bank. So doing stuff like that, taking on certain initiatives, one a year that we can hopefully affect. And uh, we just keep it fun and loose and try to have fun with it. Well, and your father's cancer diagnosis is really what brought you back to the state of Virginia. I believe you were living in Los Angeles at the time when your father got sick and you decided to move back home, be there with dad. And, you know, I, I can remember getting a phone call from you and saying, hey, meet me at the at UVA hospital. You know, you were doing something big. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I can remember meeting you up there. And you, let uh, me make sure I'm correct, you won Celebrity Family Feud and donated your profits to the University of Virginia Hospital for what they did for your father, correct? Yeah, I did. I did. Me and uh, we played uh, Family Feud on that. We played against Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Um, 
in LA family feud with Steve Harvey and went up went in and donating the, the proceeds to the UVA Emily Care Cancer Center for that in his honor, his name was called the Ralph L. Sampson Senior Hope Fund. Uh, I came back home, got a house in Harrisonburg, stayed there until we got in healthy. Um, uh, we all just circled away. My sister Joyce came back to Harrisburg and lived and worked and went back and forth to Lynchburg. So anyway, we just did what we had to do to keep our father alive, but also now can honor him in a, in a way that his legacy will last hopefully for a long time and help a lot of people. With everything that you're doing off the floor and everything that you've done on the court, you know, when you consider the career that you had both in college as well as in the NBA, if you look back and you say, this is the greatest accomplishment that I've ever had, what would that thing be? You know, inside outside the family, the greatest comment is, is being a son of Ralph Sampson Sr. and Sarah Sampson. Um, that's first and foremost to me in life. Uh, it's been that way for many, many years. I look at things more differently now because now I want to figure out how to build, keep that legacy. When I'm not here, what is that legacy going to mean? And the farm is pretty much what that means so they understand the history of uh, me and my mom and my dad as well. But the main thing is that, but also then the other thing I would say to that, and it's multiple things, is having that come right with you or Ricky Stokes or Jim Miller or my teammates. Um, Rick Carlisle, I just texted the other day and wished him a good luck on the season. So that camaraderie is special, I think, in the whole scheme of things. And I'm in the right place at the right time, just like catching the basketball from Craig Robinson and hitting the basket at the Maryland game. So those are still real for me, and I don't take that for granted. All right, Stick, I want to thank you personally for everything that you did for me growing up, showing me that a young man from the Valley could go out and not only do big things in the state of Virginia, but throughout the country and all over the world, what you did. I know that many of the people who watched you growing up were inspired by you, but more importantly, thank you for being a great guy and someone who I can reach out and talk to and sure. answers my text messages every now and then when I every hit you up. And I look, forward to, <laughs> I look forward to seeing you at Ralph Sanders' Tap House. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. I got a, I got a tab already started, so we'll, we'll get something to drink there. Come, <laughs> when you come to show up, we'll figure it out. And uh, thanks for having me. And uh, so good, good to be on anytime. Let me know. Hey, thank you for being on the rise with us, my man. We appreciate you. Be sure to check in for more Rise shows and also other original programming and memorable games on Origin Sports. I'm Corey Alexander. Thanks for joining.